Ready? Good morning. Thank you very much for being here. I'm Deborah Flint, the President and CEO of the Greater Toronto Airport Authority. I'm here to provide an update on the incremental progress that we have been making as we are on a path to restore predictability and reliability to air travel. Today I'll share many numbers and metrics, and of course these are essential in an industry as complex as the one that we lead, uh, with multiple employers, multiple agencies, pre-pandemic over 50,000 people that worked here at the airport, and of course generating billions of dollars of economic impact. But this is more than just about the numbers. My colleagues beside and behind me represent the more than 50,000 employees who worked here at Pearson pre-pandemic and the 10 million people uh, that were directly employed in the aviation industry worldwide, all who are devoted to ensuring that there is a safe, predictable, reliable, and enjoyable air travel experience. I thank them, I thank their colleagues for showing up day and night and for the expertise and the commitment that they all bring. We know that travel has not been easy for passengers. Flight delays, cancellations, long wait times, these are the stories from our friends and from our families, the stories of missed events, the late arrivals to long-awaited celebrations, or the outfits and the gifts that were so carefully planned that didn't make it to the occasions that they were intended for. Every single experience matters to me, and every experience matters to the agencies, the companies, and the employees across this airport. We will be persistent and dedicated to get through this transitionary time and to get to a more normal state once again. And that's why I'm here today to share with you where we are in this moment of transition. It is a time of recovery, one that is historic in the history of aviation. Pearson went from being from one of the most shut down airports in the world to one of the busiest. We didn't go from zero to 100, we went from zero to 500. As an example, even last December, uh, my former airport that I led, LAX in Los Angeles, was at 55% of pre-pandemic traffic levels, while we here at Pearson were barely at 25%. That makes a very dramatic difference in the story of recovery. When it comes to keeping a labor pool deep, having the right resources, and generally keeping a very complex machine running, that steep climb and the length of that shutdown matters immensely. Our pause was longer and our ramp up to this summer travel season was much steeper than many other airports. We are indeed far from the finish line, but the actions of the GTAA, the federal government, the agencies, the airlines, and many other partners working concertedly together are indeed having a positive impact. In global aviation and in this pandemic era, Toronto Pearson is very unique. Here's why. We have attributes such as being the sixth most connected airport in the world. 50% of Canada's international air passengers come right here through Pearson. We are the fourth largest entry point into the United States. This airport has two border crossings within its facilities, which is quite unique. These are differentiators that benefit the economy during the good times, but they have created strains during this recovery period with additional layers of challenge. For five years in a row, including two of the years that I have led this airport, we have been the best large airport in North America and recognized as an industry leader. We are proud to break new ground, to set best practices, to be known for innovation, and to lead the industry. A great example of this is even during the pandemic, we established a globally accredited healthy airport program and we introduced at the start of the pandemic health and safety measures that took off around the world in protection of our passengers and our employees. I'm here today to speak about the progress that has been brought about by the intense work day and night by all of our partners. I want to particularly thank our airline partners, the Canadian Air Transport Security Agency who runs the security processes here at the airport, the Canada Border Services Agency, who is the federal agency that's responsible for border control, NAV Canada, which is the entity responsible for air traffic control, the federal government, which regulates transportation, safety, 
and public health policies here at the airport. Each one has a shared responsibility for a function and an experience for our passengers, all at differentiated points amongst their journey. The intense focus of our partners, the barrier breaking by the leaders of the agencies, the working groups, the committees, the tactical teams who have worked with fervor have accelerated results. And while there is indeed still a long way to go, these efforts are yielding improvements. Our data, it shows that we are improving week over week. Airline on-time performance across the airport increased to 44% of all flights being on time. This is not a number that I would normally tout at all, but given where we have been for the last four weeks and even before that, improving from 35% is substantial. Our partners at CATSA have hired hundreds of new employees to screen here at Pearson, and that is making a difference to lineups. The latest statistics that CATSA has provided indicate that 82% of passengers are now being screened in less than 15 minutes. That's a marginal improvement, even week over week of 1%, but a more substantial improvement from the beginning of summer and spring. The Canadian government has done its part in increasing the number of border officers and also streamlined arrive can and health processes that have led to a significant reduction in the number of arriving international passengers that have been held on board, which was occurring quite frequently because there was no room in the customs halls. This happened 19 times last week compared to a rolling average of 60 holds per week for the last four weeks. And prior to that, the numbers were even more uh, extreme with hours long waits on board and a significant hundreds of numbers more that were held. For domestic travel, the average wait time for bags is now at 24 minutes for the first bag to arrive at our baggage carousels. And that is continuing to approve across all different parts of the baggage delivery system. From an employee perspective, our airlines, our retailers, our restaurateurs, they're all hiring staff and are working to train those staff. What we have seen is that the skill set of our employees at the, the airport requires expertise. It requires knowledge. So as they become new, as they are new and they become familiar with the airport operating environment, we ask that you give them your patience and give them a smile because we're thankful that they are here and have rejoined this industry. Again, there is still work to be done and accepting for acts of God such as weather, even if we had a little bit of that yesterday, uh, weather disruptions, we expect that these actions or the concerted efforts of our partners will continue to yield positive results. Our goal is for passengers to have a predictable, reliable, and enjoyable journey. We know that travel is still very complex. Many other airports and national airlines are having significant restart problems across the, the globe. Measures related to COVID-19 still continue to linger at Canada's airports as well. But to put the power back in our passengers' hands, to help them be active enablers of a smoother experience, we're committed to providing more tools that will give insight into what they can expect. These tools include interactive infographics, wait time dashboards with information on how busy each terminal is at various points of the day, depending on the type of travel that they are embarking on. And that is based on a rolling two week average of actual process times. Also on our website, there's new at a glance resources that you'll be able to see this information that I'm sharing today on a more real time basis. All of these are available on our website now and we're developing new tools with a drive to provide live wait times for key processes in the passenger journey. And we will have that live in the near future. For five years, including the two pandemic years that I have led the GTAA, Toronto Pearson has been an award-winning airport, and we are determined to get back to that status. We have a strong vision for the future, building on our past capabilities and successes, and taking the opportunity to seize this crisis and to propel us forward to be even better. Travel in 2019 does seem like the good old days, but 2019 travel across the industry was still very challenged, and this is our opportunity to make the industry even better than it was before. But we have to take steps to get there. But we have confidence because we've seen improvements already. 
We've moved customs forms from being an extra step at a machine inside our customs hall to now being able to be filled online 72 hours before your departure. This coupled with our investment that we have made in state-of-the-art technology of e-gates in our customs halls, along with Canadian Border Services Agency, opens the door to the near future of an almost fully digital border. You can now see on our website live security wait times. And in the near future, virtual queuing will allow passengers to reserve their space and time uh, in the security screening line before they show up at the airport, giving more support certainty, more choice to the passenger, which is what we strive to give. When I joined the GTAA, I saw great potential for this airport to be the leading airport of the future, and I continue to see that opportunity today. This is our moment to seize it. But for today, the reality is this ecosystem here and at airports around the world is still fragile. There is significant work still to be done to get Pearson back on track. But we, along with our partners, we are steadfast in that commitment to continue enhancing the passenger experience and to get through this transitionary era in air travel. We'll be holding these events to share updates on a regular basis, and I look forward to communicating more progress as it unfolds over the weeks and months to come. I'm now happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Deborah. Over to Christina at CP24. Hi, Deborah. Thank you so much. Um, throughout the last few weeks, there had been this great suggestion, even from uh, you know, some organizations, federal politicians, uh, that it was COVID-19 measures and health measures that were causing delays at Pearson Airport. Uh, but an investigation that was done, a report suggests that the airlines sold way too many flights, more than they could handle and more than even the airport uh, Pearson could accommodate. Looking back, was, was that one of the main causes of delays and sort of what was the chaos here at Pearson? Uh, this, we've all looked at the contributing causes to this issue, and the story changes over time. Uh, over time, we've seen that there have been a number of contributing factors. This is a very complex environment and ecosystem. There are, there are a lot of connected parts that affect each other. You know, certainly the issues of processing time, health uh, requirements that contributed to uh, extended processing time, as well as a general labor environment and shortage of labor and the skilled labor that needed to come back into the system all created those significant challenges. You know, from an airline and a sales perspective, uh, you know, there'll be, there are many different perspectives on that. I'll share, you know, a few of my thoughts. Uh, you know, we have worked very carefully and closely with our airlines over the course of the entire pandemic. Collaboration is very essential for an industry as connected as this one is. Back in early uh, winter, when we were establishing the summer schedules, we actually metered and implemented some capacity reductions for the summer season for a number of reasons. When we saw in spring that processing times were increasing and that labor was challenged and the system was fragile, we worked on a voluntary basis with our air carriers to reduce the schedules. Over 1.5 million seats were reduced out of the schedules for the remainder of summer. And again, what we're seeing is that those are having positive effects. We're seeing the improvement in on-time performance and the reduction in the delays, and the reduction in cancellations and providing more certainty. So that, that work collectively and collaboratively uh, is what we set out to do and we're seeing the end results of that with our partners. And Deborah, as you know, uh, recently the Wall Street Journal called Pearson Airport the worst airport in the world. Um, obviously that's that's not news you as a leader would welcome uh, are, are you concerned that this will continue to maybe keep people from coming here in some capacity have people been avoiding the airport or have people moved on from that and are some of these measures anticipated even you know from a public relations perspective to say we've heard you we understand as you acknowledge people have missed some important events and we don't want to be number one on that list. I mean, I mean, can you say you're not, not, not going to be number one on that list? 
there is a tremendous pent-up demand for people to travel. We've seen that. We know how important it is, especially after people not, our passengers not being able to travel for almost two years, how critical it is. And that's a great signal of strength for the Canadian air travel market. And we care about that experience. Uh, we are committed there, whether it's myself, every single person on my team and across this airport is committed to ensuring that they, we deliver the best experience for Canadians and for international travelers that are transferring through our airport. We are an award-winning airport for five years. That is in our DNA. Uh, we will continue to solution, to be persistent, to continue to innovate, to create new opportunities and solutions. Again, not just to get back to where we were, but to create the opportunity for the airport of the future, one that is even even better than it was in 2019. We see that digital future and we're seizing it so passengers can have more tools, more opportunities to curate their experience and can have confidence in that experience as they travel through Pearson. Liam from the Canadian Press. Good morning, Deborah. Um, what is your outlook on operational targets on late flights, wait times, plane holds, and the like? We're going to continue to solution and work with our partners on improving processing time, uh, enhancing and shoring up the labor market so that there are all the right people in the right places at the right time. And the measures on processing and digital tools that we've already seen are having a positive effect on on-time performance, on baggage delivery, on reduction in cancellations. We see these are having a great effect and we're confident that as we continue to have intense focus with our partners on these issues, Issues, that they will continue to improve. Again, there are always acts of God and weather and things that are out of the system's control, uh, but for those controllable uh, performance measures, we're very focused and intent and confident that this is a transitionary period, and as the system becomes more stable, that performance will continue to increase. Will you commit to any uh, performance targets? We're committing to creating the airport of the future, continuing to develop, deliver d digital tools for the passengers, uh, bringing more technology so that the experiences that you have, like you can control so much about your life uh, through digital tools and you have more certainty and predictability uh, in your normal life. We want to see the airport experience mirror that, where your check-in process and your baggage delivery process and navigating the airport all becomes very known, uh, familiar, and um, available through technology to a traveling passenger. Uh, Moman from 680 News. Good morning, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I just wanted to ask, um, over here you say that 44% uh, of flights are on time. I just wanted to know what is that number normally uh, when these issues don't exist and uh, what can be done to get back to that number as quickly as possible? Yeah, there is, you know, it really is dependent on the time frame that you measure on time performance. Uh, we've seen some metrics that measure it over like six weeks, which is unusual. I look at on time performance on a daily basis, and I look at it by different sectors um, and different parts of the travel system. As we've said here, we run a very unique airport with both international service, domestic service, which is fairly typical of a large hub airport in the global system. But again, we also have two borders within our airport, including the trans border into the United States as a fourth largest entry point into the United States. So we do those metrics by all the sectors. 40%, as I said, is not a number that we would strive for, but it is certainly better than some of the 25 or sub 20% that we've been seeing, uh, particularly in the earlier part of summer. You know, certainly I look forward to the days when we're back above 50 and well into the 70 and 80%. There are always going to be issues with air travel. It's a globally connected system, so an issue that's in Europe, it might be weather or it might be airport operations related, or an issue that's on the eastern seaboard with weather is going to uh, affect our on-time performance. But we're here to make sure that the majority of the time, uh, those issues notwithstanding, we're delivering a very reliable uh, air travel service for the passengers here. And just um, optically speaking, it seems like Terminal 3 doesn't have as many of the issues as Terminal 1 does in terms of lineups, secure, people going through security, all that kind of thing. Is that actually the case? Are things different at Terminal 3? And if that is the case, why is there a difference between what's happening here and there? 
Uh, there is definitely a difference between the two terminals in terms of the complement of our air carriers, uh, the types of services, and the quantity of services that are offered, both from an international versus domestic and a transborder perspective. So it's not unusual to be able to see some uh, dis uh, some differences between the performance between one terminal or another. But we're focused on working with all of our carriers, both our Canadian carriers as well as our international and United States carriers, to make sure that every single single carrier uh, is offering great reliable service for the passengers here at Pearson. Global News, Sean O'Shea. Uh, good morning, Mr. Flynn. Uh, you didn't at all answer my colleague Liam Casey's question from the Canadian press about assuring people about how long it was going to take to get through this process. Won't you say, or don't you have the numbers, or don't you have a target? Because internally you must have a plan. That's why you're here saying all these nice things about the future and digital and all these great message points. Don't you have some numbers? Don't you have some actual targets that you can share because you brought us all here today? Yeah, we're here to share that the, the plan that we have been working in concerted effort, the intensity of that with our, with our partners, uh, is yielding results. It is having a very significant effect, and we're going to continue to work on that. Uh, as you know, Sean, this is a very complex ecosystem, whether it's uh, Customs and Border Protection and the processes that happen there, uh, if they happen to have a challenge in the morning startup, that will create a knock-on effect with CATS and security screening that then has to sometimes stop. And then that creates a knock-on effect with baggage delivery and on-time performance. I'll wait for a minute. I'll wait for a minute for that, for that noise. We have, we have many tools in the fire, many initiatives that are underway, and each one of them is about improving performance, improving reliability, and shoring up where there are weaknesses uh, in those systems. And we are going to continue to work on that and deliver improvements over the course of time. And a follow-up. I mean, I don't think any traveler expects perfection. Certainly, if that was what they were expecting, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be satisfied. Uh, obviously, air travel is variable. There's bad weather. They all understand that. but. People I interviewed here today, when you a couple of days when you announced the E-Gates or showed the E-Gates, said Toronto was so far behind other airports like Istanbul and like Dubai and like other world-class cities that this airport for years has said that they're trying to, to emulate. Again, can you please give people who are flying through this airport some reassurance of specifically about how long it's going to take or not take and how quickly you're going to get to these targets that you're talking about? Thank you. Thank you, Sean. I, I see that this pandemic has created an opportunity. Uh, and you, many leaders like myself will say, don't let the crisis go to waste. Uh, what I've seen in the modernization and working with government on tools that, you're correct, have been in place in other airports. If you look at United States, I ran one of the largest airports in the U.S., trusted traveler and pre-check clear biometric screening has been in place for years and works very effectively. And so the government of Canada is a partner with us at the table now, and I've started to see the opening of those advancements. We've now taken, with the government, moved the customs declaration to be electronic, to be online. That is a substantial step. To me, that opens up the opportunity for uh, a fully biometric uh, arrival, international arrival process. I look forward to the day when we can take out the stop at the picks, which is to fill out the customs declaration, to now be purely mobile. We get rid of the picks. That opens up space in the, in the arrivals hall. Uh, the arrivals hall were not planned to have those machines in them, and we moved to the biometrics. We invested in those e-gates, got the support of government as a result of this crisis, and so that's where I see that the crisis can propel us to move forward and have a more digital, a more modern, a more competitive arrival and screening experience than before. And the discussions with the government are around enabling trusted traveler and pre-check or clear-like operations here across airports in Canada. We have two more questions. First to the CBC. Hi there. Uh, I'm just wondering if you spoke about staffing at the beginning, your 50,000 pre-pandemic uh, staff members. Where are you with that now and what's being done to hire more people on? 
I can share that whether it is the airlines, whether it is cat saws, I've said hired hundreds of new screeners, our restauranters, our retailers. Every single day we're seeing more and more applications uh, for what's known as airport that passes and badges for employees to be able to work here in the airport. Uh, we are very similar, however, to some of the other service sectors outside of the airport where attracting, retaining, training workers does take time, but we are seeing steadily, steady progress. The labor absolutely was a contributor to some of the challenges that we've had over the past weeks and months. And again, the numbers do reflect that labor is becoming more stable uh, and that hires, hirings are happening. And we're seeing the results uh, as a, we're seeing the improvements as a result. But what are, what are those numbers? And you said 50,000, where are we now? Um, we're certainly more than half of that 50,000, but it is changing on a, on a consistent basis. And we can get you some of those stats going forward. And it went down to how many? It was a very difficult number to ascertain because there were people that still had their passes that were not you know, actively employed. Uh, but uh, it did drop significantly. Again, our, our level of activity uh, dropped to less than 25%. And much of that was uh, in the very early parts of COVID. So we've been very challenged with uh, how deep the drop was of passenger traffic here at Pearson. And our final question. Thank you for your time, Ms. Flint. Uh, David Menzies with Rebel News. Um, Ms. Flint, on Wednesday, the Canada Border Services Agency issued a press release about alleged improvements to the disastrous Arrive Can app. But the press release was ominous for two reasons, I think. One, there was absolutely no mention when the Arrive Can app is going to be retired. Secondly, there was no mention of COVID, which is the ostensible policy reason for having the Arrive Can app in place in the first place. Therefore, the conclusion is it looks like the Justin Trudeau Liberals want Arrive Can to be a permanent fixture for Canadian air travel. And my question to you is, are you lobbying this government to get rid of this lousy app so that this airport can finally start to function as it should be. The, the federal government is responsible for health and security and border screening policies at this airport. We absolutely have a seat at the table with the government to talk about how those policies and practices affect the airport and how we can work more effectively together to improve the passenger experience, to decrease the processing times and to increase the, t the ability for passengers to control their journey. What we've seen along the way is that the health requirements that were previously in the airport, arrival testing taking place here, uh, requirements for employees, that those have been removed. And we've seen an incredible change in the efficacy of processing as a result. As I shared earlier, I believe that the future can be more digitally enabled. I will say that I am pleased to see that the Arrive Can has been adapted to include the customs arrival function, so that it eliminates the time that an individual is spending at a kiosk in the airport. The individual did not used to spend time at a kiosk in the airport doing that function. It used to be filled out on paper, and not that that was a great solution, but it kept it out of the airport processing space and function. So with that addition, we've seen a significant reduction in processing time uh, with the adaptation of those mobile tools. What the mobile tools in the future are remains to be seen, but what I'm advocating for is the airport of the future to be digitally equipped with mobile-enabled tools, biometric tools, and modern screening functions. And Ms. Flint, a follow-up question. As you, I'm sure, are well aware, FlightAware published a report which indicates Pearson is the absolute worst airport in the entire world in terms of delayed flights. You're the fourth worst for cancellations. What's really troubling is this report includes data for airports that are situated in third world countries. In addition, the lineups here are outrageous. There are literally tons of lost luggage. There are people who have had their animals almost die due to dehydration because they got lost. Not that it seems that the staff here uh, cares about that. My question is, because Pearson is a mismanaged mess and an international laughingstock, has any GTAA employees uh, been fired or 
indeed, Ms. Flint, have you even considered tendering your resignation? I am joined here by a res representative group of people that reflect the, the unwavering commitment to make this airport better. Um, everything that you've said about the passenger experience here, I take to heart. I take accountability. I am deeply committed to making sure that the passengers have a great and reliable experience. And as I've led the airport to be one of the top airports in the world, I'm committed to making sure that we rise back to that status once again. Toronto Pearson is very unique, and this is not uh, uniquely to per Toronto Pearson. We are in a significant transitionary environment coming out of a global pandemic, a global pandemic that's quite not over as of yet. And so we're working through those issues. We have an incredible strength in leadership in the industry, one that is going to give us the confidence that we can move this airport back forward. But the strengths of being the sixth most internationally connected world, uh, airport in the world and the complexity that comes along with that, two borders within our airport facilities, being the largest uh, airport in Canada, these are all significant strengths for the future, but they are also challenges in the immediate. When I think the stories will be told that we rose from the most challenging situation of airports across the world back to the greatest heights, and I'm committed to making sure that happens. Thank you very much, Deborah, and everybody else for joining. That concludes the conference.